Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure and honor uh, to introduce to you uh, Dr. Jorge Castaneda. He was the Foreign Minister for the Republic of Mexico uh, from 2000 to 2003. Presently, he's on uh, the faculty at New York University. Uh, I've had the privilege uh, of hearing Dr. Castaneda speak uh, about three months ago before a group uh, as large of, as you, if not larger, of federal judges in the Southern District, uh, I mean, in the Southern United States. And uh, he is an outstanding speaker. He is extremely knowledgeable about uh, the relations between Latin America, Mexico, and the United States. And I think that you will find uh, uh, his, uh, his talk to be very, very enlightening and, and uh, uh, very educational. I also twice than just once, particularly when it's both times done so eloquently. Uh, before I start uh, my comments today, I would like to say a couple of things very quickly, though I will make some more specific comments at the, when we give you back your essays. I didn't read all of them, obviously, but I read about 10 of them. And I must say, I was very impressed. These are very well written, very well researched, very well thought out and well argued. Uh, pieces of work. So really, congratulations to those high school students uh, among you who wrote these essays. You obviously have underestimated or dismissed and swept under the carpet as if it didn't exist. But we should always, always place those conflicts, those problems, those differences of opinion in the context of an extraordinarily complex, diverse uh, relationship which by and large we manage well. Both countries manage well. Both governments manage well. Both societies manage well. And this is a very important issue to underline. It's, this is not only a government to government relationship. It's a society to society relationship. And you in the Valley, of course, know this better because sometimes it's not so easy to distinguish in places like the Valley between the two societies. Maybe it's one society that straddles the border. And maybe over time that will extend to other areas of the border and other areas of our two nations. And it's important always to emphasize that yes, there is a government to government relationship. Yes, it is undoubtedly the most important one, but there is also a society to society relationship and that is also enormously important. In this 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 with the United States on security issues and on anti-terrorism issues because this is fundamental for the United States. The U.S. is right, it has to defend itself. And its friends and neighbors particularly have to help it defend itself. And there is a logic to people trying to enter the United States to harm the United States through Mexico. It makes a lot of sense. That's the easiest way to do it. So the Mexican authorities have to be as helpful, as active, as skillful as possible in cooperating and that's what they have done which is why together with u.s efforts there has not been a single incident so the wall has nothing to do with terrorism it has to do with placating the extreme right wing of american politics it has nothing to do with terrorism or pigment of people's imagination who do not know better. President Clinton, I think, very mistakenly, built his own fence. President Bush is not the first one to start with a fence. Clinton built his fence, and he built his fence from Playas de Tijuana around Rosalito to beyond the Otay Mesa or the airport in Tijuana. He started building it in 96, it was finished in 97, and all it did was push people east into the desert to cross. More people died crossing. 
the price of crossing went up exponentially, the polleros and coyotes charged more money, it became a business worthy of the interest of organized crime, but these last 10 years, more people have entered the United States without papers than ever before. So that's what fences get you, nothing. So I think it makes more sense, as I said, to adapt laws to reality instead of trying to adapt reality to the law. I was just wondering what your solution would be for keeping not only Mexicans out, but solving um, Mexico's problem of having too many people leave their country. In the long term, the only solution is, as President Calderon and every president in Mexico since Porfirio Diaz has said, to create jobs in Mexico. Yeah, <laughs> this is not exactly rocket science. That's the solution. Now, the real question is, how do you create enough jobs in Mexico, given the very high population growth that we had 40 years ago? Mexican population is not growing anymore, hardly at all. The same, we're seeing the same phenomenon in Mexico today that we saw in Western Europe, in Spain, and in Italy about 30 years ago. That very Catholic countries for some reason that no one understands very well, at some point stop having babies. The Mexican population growth has dropped precipitously the last 10 years. But that doesn't help us with the people who were born 20 years ago. They're already there. Or the people who were born 30 or 40 years ago who are not alone already there, but who are now having fewer babies than before. But then since they are more people, there are still more babies. We have to create, there, there are about a million three hundred thousand people entering the job market every year in Mexico, from 18 to 25, more or less. The Mexican economy, even if it grows at 5 or 6%, which it hasn't been doing, can only generate seven to 800,000 jobs. So there's three or 400,000 missing. If this was happening in Australia, it would be difficult for people to swim across the Pacific to get to the United States. Most people can't do that. If all you have to swim across is the so-called river here, well, it's pretty easy. It's not so much what can be done in Mexico. We can do much more in the sense that our economy has to grow more. Our economy has been growing at only two and a half or three percent for on average per year for the last 15 years. That's not enough. It should be growing at five or six percent. And if it starts growing at five or six percent per year soon, if we do the things that we have to do, then there will be more jobs created and perhaps a few fewer people coming. But it's going to be a long time before we are able to create enough jobs for people not to come. Just think of it this way. It's not that complicated. You may not see it here because the wage differential right here is perhaps not as great. A person in New York who works and comes up through the ranks in a restaurant, starts washing dishes, then with the traditional Mexican ingenuity and skill and sensitivity and hard work, by the way, begins moving up in the kitchen and then moves out to the front of the restaurant, etc., ends up making with tips, overtime, blah, 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 can make $12, $13 an hour. An hour. That's 150 bucks a day. That's how much he makes in Mexico in a month. What would you do? Come to the United States. But again, it's not rocket science. Well, why don't they pay him $15 an hour in Mexico to wait on tables? Well, because nobody would go to the tables because nobody can afford restaurants where waiters make $15 an hour.